Let's take a trip to the far north. The Canadian Rockies, Alaska, the Arctic Circle. And let's travel the easy way in a swift, comfortable, private airplane. Let's follow a family of four on a typical journey to the 49th state. A routine trip made these days by so many flying families in modern, personal airplanes. Let's go along with Don Downey, writer, photographer, and chief pilot for this trip. His wife, Ruth, handles the packing, the maps, the money, and some of the flying, as a good co-pilot should. Backseat drivers include daughter Dana, just teenage, but already a seasoned air traveler and mighty useful to have along. And a college-aged nephew, Newt Crawford, an up-and-coming photographer on his first flight out of the country. Our plane is a 250-horsepower Piper Comanche, picked up at the Piper factory in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania. The Comanche, normally used by businessmen to speed their daily travels, carries four people in its comfortable cabin. And it carries a lot of baggage that must include almost everything for a trip this long. Even with all this personal gear, plus cameras and film, a place was found for everything. The maps and radio charts alone for the 11,000 mile trip weighed 11 pounds. We fire up the dual ignition 250 horsepower Lycoming engine and start out on a trip that will take us over the dust and gravel ribbon that is the Alaskan Highway, close to towering Mount McKinley and into the ghost towns of the Klondike. At 180 miles an hour cruising speed, we quickly span most of the United States to Great Falls, Montana in less than 11 hours flying time. Here at Great Falls, we were followed in by an airline transport. As everywhere else in the United States, airlines and private planes share the air and landing facilities on an equal basis. Since our next stop will be Calgary and Canada, we make out a flight plan requesting customs inspection when we land. This is the only formality required. Then we tuck up our landing gear and head north for Canada. Cross-country flight in a personal aircraft is usually flown at that comfortable middle level where you can really see the country. Not at seven or eight miles high where the scenery falls away to a tiny checkerboard. First stop in Canada on our northern flight is the busy expanding city of Calgary. After landing at Calgary's jet-sized international airport, we find that Canadian customs are fast, efficient, simple. No passport, no visas, no vaccination, and no language problem. However, the flight to Alaska does differ a bit from the normal cross-country trip. It takes the traveler a long distance into the boondocks, and a survival kit is just good sense. Roy Moore of Trans Aircraft Company at Calgary shows what's inside a typical emergency kit. Canned food, fishing gear, a compass, and signaling mirror. While this hat will win no prizes in the Easter Parade, it's a must for protection against the swarms of mosquitoes on the ground. From Calgary, it's merely a short hop to the picturesque Canadian Rockies at Banff and Lake Louise. Obviously, this area is a wildlife sanctuary, and the tourist brochure specifically states that park regulations prohibit the feeding or petting of wild animals. Apparently, the animals haven't read the regulations. From Calgary, our route continues north-northwest to Edmonton, a short hop of only 175 miles. One great advantage of the personal aircraft, you can make your own schedule. Take off when you want to, govern the length of each flight to your own personal desire. You're entirely your own boss. Modern radio aids make everything so simple. With the automatic direction finder, you merely tune to a station up ahead and then follow the needle. Hard work, this flying with the automatic pilot in operation. Try this in your car at 180 miles an hour. We prepare to land at Edmonton, and top off our fuel tank. Canadian weathermen are called climatologists, 
and the traffic pattern is a circuit. We fill all four tanks before heading into the back country. A total of 90 gallons will take us over 1,100 miles without refueling. A standard Comanche with extra fuel tanks established the world's non-stop distance record of 7,668 miles from North Africa to Los Angeles. From Edmonton, it's over the paved highway to Dawson Creek with a rainbow or two tossed in to enhance the view. Here at Dawson Creek is the real beginning of the Alcan, the Alaskan Highway. Everything is measured along the road from here at mile post zero. We continue northwestward along the highway and pass Fort St. John with its lighted 6,700 foot hard surface runway. Just a few miles further up the highway, the visitor sees smaller dirt flight strips that become increasingly common as we fly into the bush country. Almost all the Canadian portion of the Alaskan Highway is just gravel surface, but the road is kept open year-round. A short trip down the highway shows how the groundbound traveler fares. There's a mortality rate on people and on windshields from loose gravel. 180 miles per hour in a straight line certainly beats the recommended 35 on the highway. And here come the fringes of the Rocky Mountains. They get bigger as we travel north. Our Comanche will fly as high as 20,000 feet. But this entire trip can be made without once going over 8,000. Soon it's Fort Nelson, a busy town established back in 1682 by the Hudson's Bay Company. Modern today, its history as an outpost reads like fiction. Burned to the ground by the Indians, and rebuilt, captured by the French, and regained two years later. Fort Nelson served for over half a century as the chief port and supply depot for the fur trade. Rivers have played an all-important part in the development of this pioneer country. Riverboats like this still travel the 2,400-mile circuit down the Nelson, Laird, Mackenzie, and Peel Rivers after the ice breaks up in the spring. Today, however, much travel is by airplane. At Fort Nelson, we crossed paths with one of the many groups of private pilots who band together for the flight to Alaska. This returning group has some 30 planes piloted by flying farmers. We had company on this leg of the flight. William Berkeley, a rancher from California, was also headed for Alaska with his twin-engine Piper Apache. This gave us someone to talk to on the radio and a chance for some air-to-air -air photography as we flew up the passes of the Trout River toward Watson Lake. And we turned into the backbone of the Rockies. Not really high, but barren chunks of granite far above timberline. What a field trip for an advanced geology student. Below, the Alaskan Highway picked its tortuous way westward. It's not uncommon for an aircraft to land on the highway in the middle of this rugged pass. Plenty of room on the road and not too much traffic. However, there are a number of excellent emergency flight strips like this 6,000-foot airport. Next stop is Watson Lake, one of the most picturesque airports ever constructed, built in conjunction with the Alaskan Highway. This fine airport has full radio and teletype communications, weather briefing by the Canadian Department of Transport, airline service, fuel, and a coffee shop on the field, just as does Fort Nelson. Here, the terminal is built of logs. As the transport plane heads out, we prepare to take off for Tesla, mile 804 on the Alaskan Highway. Fifty minutes later, we were circling the Lake of the Long Water, as the Indians have translated the name Tesla. Here is a lake 90 miles long, perhaps three and a half miles wide, with some of the best fishing in the world. Over 100 Indians live in log houses on the promontory overlooking the lake. Bright four o'clock in the morning, there's a bubbling cup of black brew for the early riser who has a date with the fabulous Lake Trout of Tesla. The Longwater Lake can blow up quite a chop, and it's a rough ride in the outboard to the best fishing spots. Soon the weather calls. Here's Newt with his first giant trout on the line. He let it get away. However, more seasoned fishermen have better luck on Lake Tesla, and here is one of these avid men. Apache pilot Berkeley, 
He hooks up with a good-sized trout and patiently works in toward the boat. These are no fly cast and net trout. It takes a saltwater gaff to boat one of these beauties. This one weighed just under 10 pounds, a fair-sized sample of the record 38-pound trout pulled from Lake Tessa. This area is close to the Klondike, and old-timers report that 3,000 fortune hunters floated down this long water lake on their way to the gold fields. With only a short 30-minute hop over the highway to Whitehorse, where tales of the frenzied gold rush days fill many a book of history. The big airport at Whitehorse is close to town. Here is the only set of rapids between the headwaters of the mighty Yukon River and its mouth in the distant Bering Sea. Here, cargoes were carried around the rapids on narrow-gauge railroads. Downtown Whitehorse is modern, or an inside town. History in the form of pickaxes, stoves, coffee grinders, old horsehair sofas, is stored in Sam McGee's cabin. And history also cloaks the stern-wheel river boats that lie on the banks of the Yukon. The Canadian government plans to move these three river boats to nearby Whiskey and Moccasin Flats presently occupied by squatters, where they will be preserved as mementos of the days of 98. And of course, there are other mementos. Here's a traveler who likes to feel at home, no matter where he is. After a look at the road signs, we continue up the highway, Destination North Way, the first airport on the Alaskan side of the inland route. A simple customs notification is all it takes, and your international flight is on its way. Our route follows the Alaskan Highway as we pick our way carefully between summer clouds. Time zones change quickly in this far north country, with Anchorage on the same clock setting as Hawaii. The picturesque deep turquoise of Kliwani Lake slides beneath our wings as we cross from Canada's Yukon Territory into the new state of Alaska and approach the airport at Northway. Perhaps the first airport, motel, and cafe combination along the entire route has been constructed here at Northway where the visitor is really a long way out in the back country. Fifty miles from the nearest high school. A hundred miles from the nearest doctor. Never far from the ever-present moose antlers, sometimes called Alaska's hat rack. Here's an Alaskan husky, one of a group used at Northway in the winter. Northway frequently competes with nearby snag in Canada as the coldest spot in the North American continent. We have only one more hop to Anchorage by way of Talk Junction, the Glen Highway, and passing over the famous Copper River region. Under a heavy overcast, the glaciers of the Chugach Mountains come into view, a year-round reminder that one is north of latitude 61. This is the Dalchina Glacier on the entrance to the coastal plain. But soon we're out of the mountains and over the farms of Palmer in the Matanuska Valley, the largest agricultural area in Alaska. Here in 1935 migrated some 200 families, now there are more than 3,000 settlers in the area. It's just 40 miles more to Anchorage, our immediate goal in Alaska, so we heat check the airport directory, tune in the Anchorage Omni Range, and start our left down. Anchorage is a truly modern, air-minded city. Here, within a radius of five miles, are five major airports, all with control towers. Merrill Field handles everything from a four-engine executive plane to the smallest trainer. On the waterfront approaching Anchorage is a recently completed deep water shipping berth for ocean-going vessels, despite the 30 to 36-foot tides that prevail in the area. At low tide, many a fishing boat lies high and almost dry. Safeway Airways, Piper Distributors for Alaska, provide complete aircraft service and the latest in far north information. Information like the uh, location of the nearest native group who perform Eskimo dances several times each week during the summer months for the edification of the visitors. Not so incidentally, there's a gift shop prospering right next door, 
with a percentage of the profits aiding crippled Indian and Eskimo children. The Twin Lakes of Hood and Spinard serve as home base for more seaplanes than any other place in the world. Over 400, and a waiting list for more. Some of these seaplanes are owned by bush pilots, many by private owners who use them to get away from it all on weekends to hide away hunting and fishing cabins. Let's join an Alaskan bush pilot with his super cub on floats and travel to what might well be the eighth wonder of the world, a natural lake formed by the backwash of a glacier. Each year, Lake George near Anchorage is formed by ice from the Nick Glacier. Pressure increases until the water breaks through the tongue of the natural glacier dam and surges down the river with tremendous force. A landing on Lake George provides a closer look. window dressing, but an essential part of survival equipment, since a number of brown bear, not noted for their amiability, were visible on the hillside. Soon we're back in the traffic pattern at Lake Hood and Lake Spinard. Their control tower clears us to land. Another type of Alaskan bush pilot is Don Sheldon, who operates from Talkeetna, 80 miles north of Anchorage on the banks of the Susitna River. Yellow oxygen bottles go atop the load. Like most other bush pilots, Sheldon has a particular specialty. Some pilots prefer float planes to ferry hunters to otherwise inaccessible spots for bear, mountain sheep, and goat, caribou, and moose. Others use big-wheeled land planes to transport hunters to mountain hideaway. Don Sheldon's specialty is Mount McKinley, and the ever-increasing horde of worldwide mountain climbers attracted by the grandeur of North America's highest peak. Here is an adversary worthy of man's most daring challenge. Here we follow a supply flight in the cover airplane. It is certainly super cub country. On this particular flight, Sheldon is taking in a full load of provision for an Italian mountain climbing team. He is to land on the Kalitna Glacier with his skis extended and bring out two hikers on two successive flights. Barely visible as Sheldon lands is the sign, Dawn Land, stomped out in the snow at the right of the plane. Later in the season, he was to airlift a seriously injured Italian hiker back to a hospital in civilization from here. For the few minutes that the Super Cub is on the glacier unloading vital supplies, we circle high overhead, oxygen masks in use, in the top cover airplane. It's a rather lonesome feeling. No shoes are tied snugly to the struts of each aircraft. Inside are self-lined bunny boots, leather clothing, and specialized survival gear, just in case the weather should close in. It is not unusual to have several mountain climbing expeditions at the same time on the sides of what the Tanana Indians call Denali, the high one. Sheldon is more or less typical of today's bush pilot who likes to live far from civilization. He left Arizona in the early 1950s because there were too many people there. Here is nature's own ice cream sundae. But there's no big red maraschino cherry on top of this largest North American snow cone. It's a quick downhill flight over the green of the Chalitna River Valley to Talkeetna. Alaskan moose are frequently seen from the low-flying super cub. There are moose, mooses, and there are meese. Such curios inevitably lead to the gift shop, a somewhat necessary evil for even the airborne traveler. Here's a sample of some of the souvenirs that somehow found their way aboard our Comanche despite dire threats and lectures on overweight baggage. Moccasins make an ideal Alaskan gift, or a practical souvenir. 
Back in the Comanche, we retrace our steps from Lake Hood's sod flight strip and past the towering 20,230-foot peak of Mount McKinley and the vast national park surrounding the summit. Destination? Fairbanks, called the Golden Heart of Alaska because of its location near the geographical center of the state. The sod roof Chamber of Commerce building was erected in 1959 with proceeds from souvenir golden dollars. Alaska's northern metropolis is located 130 miles south of the Arctic Circle. There's a riverboat excursion aboard the Discovery for the tour. During this visit, the excursion boat was Alaska's only passenger sternwheeler and it took visitors on a four-hour, 25-mile trip each afternoon during the summer. Fairbanks is also the location of the farthest north institution of higher learning, the University of Alaska. Internationally renowned as a geophysical institute and center of Arctic research, the university is fully accredited and dates back to 1915. No trip to the far north is really complete without a look north of the Arctic Circle. Let's fly to Fort Yukon, where the temperature has ranged from a record 78 below zero to 100 above. By plane, this is a simple trip, though occasionally a lonesome experience. Here, the Yukon River is almost three miles wide. Today, there's a well-lighted, mile-long, all-weather airport. This town was established by the Hudson's Bay Company in 1847 and became a river port for stern wheelers, a route from St. Michael's in the Bering Sea to the gold rush town of Dawson City. Fish wheels along the river are legal only for Indians and Eskimos. Here, a member of the Athabascan tribe checks the day's catch. So far, it's only a single fish. Here, we can see the muscles of the mighty Yukon with currents up to 18 knots. The log cabins in this town are for real, not tourist attractions. When these pictures were taken, Fort Yukon was a town without a hotel, motel, or cafe. Yet, permanent buildings still have the moose antler. And for the tourists, this sign proves it all. Next is a short hop to Arctic Hot Springs, upriver from Fort Yukon. Tourists can keep all the gold they can pan and the co-pilot found two small pieces of jade. Water piped from hot underground springs produces some of the best vegetables in Alaska. The 137 degree water also supplies outdoor and indoor swimming pools for this resort just south of the Arctic Circle. The hot water springs here were discovered in 1897, reportedly by a gold prospector chasing an errant burrow. This is truly the land of the midnight sun. Heading back toward home, we follow the Yukon River to Dawson City. On top of broken clouds, the weather was smooth and beautiful. Clouds whipping by gave a real indication of our three miles per minute cruising speed. This was undoubtedly the most lonesome leg of the entire trip. There's nothing to follow but the mighty Yukon till you're back in Canada and see Dawson City. Like a big town from the air, doesn't it? During the gold rush, an estimated 40,000 people swarmed through the Klondike. Today, it's different. Some 600 year-round residents live here. Yet Dawson City is perhaps the most picturesque port of call on our entire trip. Here was a virtual ghost town, complete with endless memories of the gold rush. There's a boardwalk and the Yukon Order of Pioneers building. Storefronts were open, yet merchandise had not been stolen, nor property vandalized. May it remain ever thus. Here are golden legends and traditions of over half a century in a town where Alex Pantages, Tex Rickard, and Jack London are.
The original cabin of poet Robert W. Service is open to all. The shooting of Dan McGrew, the cremation of Sam McGee, and the spell of the Yukon came from this cabin. Here he wrote the words, I wanted gold, and I sought it. Nearby, a gold wedge was in operation, a final reminder of a long era of placer mining. Some passengers collected rocks, iron pyrite in small pieces that somehow found its way into our excess baggage. Memories of gold rush transportation systems may be found in Dawson City. Tiny narrow gauge steam engines that once hauled ore and supplies in the air. More modern transportation can be found in this huge lumbering experimental snowmobile developed by the United States Army Transportation Corps. Parked for the summer at Dawson City Airport, it awaited the Yukon's rigorous winter weather for further evaluation. Imagine changing one of these tires. It's back in the air and we head for home. Memories of our 49th state and neighboring Canada are now a dream realized. A dream of rugged mountains, placid waters, mighty rivers, picturesque natives, a sportsman's paradise, and a modern metropolis. Alaska, beautiful, fascinating, and yet so easy to reach when you have your own swift wings.